This is the Zoom 902. It's a digital multi effects processor released in 1990 and it's the first product ever released by the Zoom Corporation. There's a common issue with these devices that I will try to address. And the issue is that even though you can turn on the device, there's nothing coming from the output. I've not been able to find a schematic for this, but I've dealt with this before and I think I have a pretty good idea on what might be wrong. So let's take it apart and look inside. So I will connect an amplifier to the output of the device and on the input I will just connect a loose cord. So when touching the tip of this connector you couple a lot of noise and disturbances from your body to the input and you should hear something. But it's completely dead now. Now that we have it open we can make a pretty good guess on what type of component that might be faulty. I believe it's one of the electrolytic capacitors. Let's take a closer look. These are the modern type electrolytic capacitors. These are not made to last. They are optimized for size and for price, not for quality. So I believe that some of these or even many of these have started to deteriorate already. And I believe that there is one specific one that is causing the device to fail. So I believe that it's this capacitor. It's the charge capacitor for the charge pump. This is the datasheet for the ICL7660. This is the charge pump that's sitting on the opposite side of the PCB from the faulty capacitor. This datasheet does a pretty good job of explaining what a charge pump does. And there's one sheet in particular that I think is very useful. So we'll take a closer look at this picture to understand how a charge pump works. So this is the circuit design of the charge pump simplified. We can see that we have a voltage input that's supposed to be DC and we have an output voltage that's supposed to be minus V in. So let's say you have 5 volt on the input, that means you will get minus 5 volt on the output. So this circuit uses a control signal that is generated internally using an internal oscillator and it tells these switches to either open or close. And then we have an inverter and the output of this inverter tells these two switches to close or open. So we can see that since this inverts the signal it will look something like this instead. So this signal but inverted. So let's look at what happens when the control signal is high and when it's low. So let's start with high. If the control signal is high here let's say the, that means that these switches will be closed and these two switches will be open. Current will flow from V in into the capacitor and to ground. And current will flow here until this capacitor is charged. And then at the negative poles these two will be open and these two will be closed. And in that part of the cycle this capacitor will transfer its charge to this one. To summarize, in the first part of the cycle C1 will be charged and it will have a positive voltage above ground. In the second part of the cycle the reference ground will switch from the negative pin of the capacitor to the positive pin of the capacitor, which means that the capacitor will now have minus on its negative pin in reference to ground. And that is the voltage that we want to extract. So I've drawn an equivalent circuit of the two cases. So on the positive flank we have this circuit. Current will be flowing into the capacitor this way on this part of the cycle, charging this capacitor. And on the negative part of the cycle, the equivalent circuit would look like this instead. This is the same capacitor as this one. So this one is charged and it wants to transfer the charge to C2. So what happens is that this capacitor will discharge to ground and the current will flow through it and it will pull the current from this node which will then pull current from this capacitor thereby transferring charges from this capacitor to this one. So when this procedure is stabilized these two capacitors will have the same charge and then the cycle is repeated C1 is charged once again and then on the negative flank 
we now have this capacitor that is fully charged and this capacitor is charged only halfway so this time it will transfer not as much charge as last time but there will still flow some current here since this capacitor has higher charge than this one and in the next cycle it will transfer even less charge and this continues until C2 is fully charged now of course if you use this for anything that means that you will draw some current from C2 as well to the output load so let's assume that C1 and C2 has the same capacitance in the first part of the cycle C1 is charged and in the second part of the cycle some of the charge from C1 is transferred to C2 so in the first cycle it will rise from 0 volts to negative half the input voltage because if the capacitance is equal for C1 and C2 in the first cycle when the transfer has occurred they will have equal amount of charge and will therefore be at the same voltage in the second cycle C1 is charged once again and nothing happens to C2 and then in the second part of the second cycle C1 will transfer its charge to C2 once again this time when balance has occurred between the charges of C1 and C2 it will raise to it will go to minus V in times 0.75 volts and then on the charging cycle nothing happens it will charge a little more and it will continue like this until it eventually reaches minus V in so this is the ideal case no load but in case you have a load, which you will have if you use this in a circuit of course, there will be a constant current draw from C2 at all time, which means that it will not reach quite as high as in the ideal case. And then, in the part where C1 charges up, there will still be some current draw from C2, so the charge will slightly decrease here. And then it will charge up once again, then it will decrease a bit during the charging of C1 and then it will increase again and it will continue like this so it will take a little longer to charge while you draw current from C2 so you can see that when the voltage stabilizes to minus V in there will still be some current draw during the idle part of the period so there will be some ripple on V out and the ripple depends on how big C2 is and it depends on how much current you draw from the circuit. So charge pumps are often good fits for low current application because then you won't have that much ripple. So in our Zoom 9002 C1 is the capacitor that I believe is faulty. And one thing that can happen to a faulty capacitor is that the equivalent series resistance increases. So all capacitors have an equivalent series resistance and it can be visualized with a resistor in series with the capacitor. So let's look at what happens with the circuit when this resistance increases. On the first part of the cycle, where C1 is supposed to be charging, a large current will flow into C1 to charge it during a very short period of time. But if the equivalent series resistance is too big, that means that this charging process will be much slower than usual and that means that during this pretty short cycle it may be that the capacitor will not have time to fully charge so when it's then discharged it will only be able to transfer a fraction of the charges to C2 than it's supposed to and that will result in V out being much lower than it should be this is what IC looks like and this is the capacitor in question. This is C1. And this is the output capacitor. So I've seen people suggest that in order to test if this capacitor is faulty, you place an equal capacitor in parallel with this one. Now that is a method you should be very careful with because if you do that in the wrong situation, it might damage the circuit. So you should study the schematic very carefully before doing something like that. So instead, I would suggest that you start with reading the V out voltage with a multimeter. If you have the correct output voltage here, then it's obviously something else in the circuit that's wrong. If you don't have the correct output voltage, you measure the input voltage to see if that is correct. 
and if there's something wrong with the input voltage then obviously the fault is before this circuit. So if this looks good and this looks bad then the error has probably something to do with the circuit. So in order to eliminate the IC circuit itself you can measure the second leg of the IC to see the switching. So here you should see a square wave that correlates with the control signal. So since we don't have the complete schematic of the design it's hard to say what might be faulty on the output of the IC but for this case I found that the most likely component to fail is this one. So these surface mount capacitors could be a bit tricky to remove but there's still a small piece of the pad exposed on which you can place the soldering iron. And the pins of these capacitors do still bend slightly so it's possible to heat it in one end and then slightly bend it backwards. So while doing this be very careful not to do it too fast because then you will rip off the pads on the PCB. So luckily enough there's two through hole vias here that you can use to place a standard through hole capacitor in, in case you don't have any surface mount capacitors laying around. So let's see if it works. <laughs> 